So tonight, we're going to have a presentation from Ryan Kovacs, WG4I, who started in ham radio back in 2012, upgraded to extra class in 2017. He's an active soda activator. For those of you who don't know what soda is, it summits on the air, and a VHF contester. He started doing soda and VHF contesting in 2015 and quickly made a name for himself. He has won the overall June VHF single operator FM only category in 2015, 16, 17, and 20. He was the second person in Georgia to earn the mountain goat for soda. Besides contesting, Ryan, Lee current, Ryan currently splits his ham radio time, helping out with Forsyth County Eris as the county AEC and with the Georgia MAT team. So tonight I'd like to introduce you all to Ryan, WG4I. Take it over. All right, so um, hope you guys are excited. Um, I, I really enjoy doing VHF contesting and just going to mountaintops in general. So um, I was uh, actually putting this presentation to, together today. I thought I had something and I didn't. So uh, um, I worked on it today and put it together. So a little bit about my background. You heard a little bit about it, but first license in 2012 is KK4OSG. Um, you know, and then I upgraded to general class three weeks later. I didn't know at the time when you took your technician that you were able to uh, take the next level for free and I missed it by three questions and that just gave me all the determination to uh, get to general faster. So um, did some studying and then took the exam and got to general and then I stayed there for a while. Um, in 2013, the ARL introduced the FM only category for the, the VHF contesting. I uh, did my first sort of activation in February 2015 and uh, got involved with that along with the VHF contesting the same year. Then bought my first HF radio to do HF for soda in uh, about mid 2015. So I had my general for a while. Never got on the air until 2015 to use that uh, extra license, that uh, the, the extra privileges. And then um, in uh, at some point in there, I got my extra and then I changed my call sign to WG4I in late June of 2017. Hey, hey Ryan. Um... As yep. Dave mentioned, you're in. You're showing us the presenter mode. Oh, okay. You if know you go up to display settings, yeah, and swap. There we go. There. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's better. Knew something wasn't right. <laughs> like, why is it on the wrong screen? Um. So, this is early in my soda activation of uh, Big Cedar Mountain in uh, 2015, and that picture's on Preacher's Rock, looking south. There was about six inches of snow on the summit that day. But um, despite how cold it looks, it was actually pretty nice out. So some um, milestones. Uh, I was looking back and realized uh, in 2014, I didn't have, I, I never submitted a log. And I, was, I remember there was something special about that year. I was still trying to figure out how to contest. So I don't remember how many contacts I made, but by the time I figured out how to submit a log, it was too late. And so I said, well, forget it. And then um, January 2015 rolled around and it was a really nice day. And I'm like, I'm going to go up Sawney Mountain and take my radio and see how many contacts I can make. So went up there and I made about 20 contacts with the furthest one being about 80 miles on uh, two meters. And I think uh, 65 miles on 70 centimeters. And I was hooked from that. I was like, man, I got to. I got to do this. So I submitted that log. I figured out how to do that. And then in uh, June of 2015, I did Blood Mountain, came in first overall and figured, well, that worked out really well. So the next year, uh, you know, for the VHF contest, June 2016, I did Blood Mountain again, came first overall with 176 contacts. And I actually had to pack up after lunch on Sunday due to storms. And that seems to be an ongoing theme for me for that. Um, 20, uh, 2017, decided to change locations to Wyabald in North Carolina. And I ended up running out of battery around 7 p.m. on Sunday night. And it was just after six meters had opened up to the Northeast and I started making contacts. I was like, 
I was kind of bummed. I, at least I got some in and then my battery was pretty much done. In 2018, um, and this is all for like the Ju June VHF contest. I, I like the June VHF contest because I, I really don't want to be freezing to death outside somewhere. And I like to go to mountaintops. So it's uh, June usually seems to work out pretty good for me. September, I usually hang out with uh, another group. And then January, I just uh, either operate from home or just casually. So um, June 2017, why a bald first overall there. And uh, let me see, what am I missing here? So June uh, 2018, mixed it up, went to the Dry Tortugas. So kind of on the opposite end. It was a mini D expedition, made over 206 meter contacts uh, going down there. And that was the goal to just work six meters. And I'll talk about a little bit that little of that later. And uh, 2019 is missing because I had a skip due to uh, some travel. And then 2020, I was at uh, on Raven Bald, I made first overall. And uh, that's the second highest peak in Georgia. And then again, uh, bad thunderstorms on Sunday afternoon, had to stop operating about 1 p.m. packed up and we were hiking and off uh, the mountain by about 3.30. So 2021, hopefully I will be back at Raven Bald and hopefully my pack weight will be under 50 pounds. So I'm working on some things to lighten that load. So I was looking today and I, I didn't realize that uh, ARRL had this. And I was like, wow, I, you know, I'm pretty modest, but I was looking, I was like, wow, I'm in the first four of the top five <laughs> category for single, uh, single operator FM. So that kind of shocked me. But uh, so you can see my old call sign there and then uh, slot number two with my new call sign. So hopefully this year I can beat my top score of uh, the 6,976 points, try to try to break into 7,000 at least. So hopefully with some luck, we won't have thunderstorms on Sunday afternoon. I don't like to be on top of a mountain with the uh, metal poles sticking up in the air. Uh, this is the first June VHF contest I did from Blood Mountain. You can see I had, I think I just had my single two meter 440 log periodic there. So it was a fairly simple setup. And uh, for six meters I had a couple wire antennas and uh, I had a 220 antenna that was a roll up J pole. So these are kind of like my physical rules, not really contest rules for VHF contesting, but um, height really matters above all else. That's kind of my number one rule, except for well, we'll talk about the dry tortugas, but uh, that's kind of opposite. Um, you're limited by radio line of sight. So, you know, the higher you get, the better out you can get, but there is a certain limitation to it because of the curvature of the earth. So it's probably theoretically in Georgia, 80 or 90 miles. June is an excellent month for tropoducting on two meters. Um, almost every, um, almost, almost every year that I've done it, I've had some type of ducting or enhancement Last year wasn't so lucky. I didn't really get a whole lot on two meters and six meters was just on the fringe. Um, FM takes a really good um, duck to, to get, uh, get a contact and, and the E skip on six meters has to be pretty strong too. Uh, June is uh, the peak of the E skip season on six meters. So that's another reason that I do the June contest. And uh, the two meter calling frequency can get really busy. Uh, they originally, they didn't have the two meter calling frequency available to use, <clears throat> but um, I think a couple of years ago, they, they opened it up. But now that more people are seem to be using it, I, you know, I spread out to other adjacent frequencies and you almost have to be net control because there's so many people on it sometimes. And uh, directional and gain an antennas help a lot, especially when you're on a mountaintop, you can, uh, point one direction and, and kind of work those people and then, and then point another direction. But um, again, you know, a lot of times people can hear you, but they can't hear the other people. So uh, there'll be multiple people calling you and you kind of have to play net control there. 
So June 2016, I was back on Blood Mountain. A little bit better antenna for six meters. So you see, I uh, have a modified Moxon antenna there. And then I uh, had put the roll, uh, roll up J pole for 220 kind of hanging off there off the, one of the guy lines. So a little bit better every year. I try to improve things and um, see what I can uh, do to lighten the load. My backpack that year was, I think, 50 pounds. So I was able to drop it. This is kind of an abbreviated rule list here, but um, some of the more notable rules from the ARL. The contest starts at 2 p.m. Saturday and runs through 11 p.m. Sunday, actually technically 10.59 p.m., but 2 to 6 p.m. on Saturday is usually the busiest time. Um, it's pretty much nonstop making contacts, at least for me, during that time. Um, contacts have to be simplex. You can't do it through repeater. They do, do not count. Also, uh, the uh, 220 and uh, 440 megahertz contacts are worth double the points, they're two points each. So I try to concentrate on those. Call sign, grid square required to be exchanged. You don't have to exchange um, a signal strength or anything like that. So just need the call sign and grid square. And then there's also different regions of the US to participate in, and we're in the Southeast region. This was a 2017 contest from Wyatt Bald in North Carolina. And I uh, had a screen tent there, and luckily I only had to walk about a quarter mile to set this up. So I had a little more um, as far as equipment since I didn't have to hike everything in. Um, some advantages of F FM contesting. A lot of people use and have two meter FM. You know, if you um, if you've been licensed in the last twenty years, two meter FM was probably your first radio that you got. HTs use FM, and a lot of people monitor the two meter calling frequency. If you have a pretty good radio you'll definitely hear traffic on the two meter calling frequency uh, during the daytime. Uh, today was a little quiet. I usually monitor when I'm working at home and uh, there's usually at least two or three of us that are always monitoring the frequency and, um, and, and the guys that have, that I'm thinking about, they have really, really good stations. One's in Murphy, North Carolina, and he comes in here five, nine to my station. And then there's another guy in Jasper and he has a really, really good station. So that's Blood Mountain 2015. And I don't know if you can see my mouse moving. Notice the heavy sealed lead acid battery on the left there to the radio. So I had two of those in addition to a smaller lithium polymer battery. And I learned my lesson the next year not to uh, carry such a heavy battery. So <laughs> I ended up made, making that change uh, the following year. FM contesting disadvantages. So FM is really not good for weak signal work. Uh, you can have a penalty of about 10 dB or more versus single sideband. FM also uses more power and uh, FM takes more bandwidth than a single sideband. Also another thing to consider, lots of radios are SDR based um, instead of the super heterodyne receivers. Um, all my receivers are the super heterodyne. And um, it's really noticeable when you get on summits that have a lot of RF interference. Uh, Stone Mountain is really bad. If you get up there, say with the Baofeng, I've heard people calling uh, CQ from up there and there's tons of people coming back to him, but he can't hear anything because the front end is just so overloaded. So that's one thing to uh, think about if you're, you know, you're trying to um, call from a summit that has a lot of uh, other radio equipment up there. Also, uh, people, you'll, you'll catch people that tend to be mobile or don't do contests and you ask them their grid square and they have no clue. So, um, or they're not aware there's even a contest and then sometimes you have to explain, yeah, there's a contest this weekend. And so that can get um, kind of frustrating too if you're trying to make a lot of contacts, especially uh, Saturday afternoon. There's a picture of Wyatt Bald and uh, the antenna set up. So by then I had added a uh, 
220 Yagi to the, the stack. That's the, the one lower on there. So some personal reasons why I do it. I, I think it's really cool to make long distance uh, contacts, even like with like FM on uh, two meters or 440. And people are always amazed. Or one time I was on Blood Mountain with my HT and just a rubber duck antenna. And um, I think I called out and two guys came back and they were blown away that, that they couldn't believe I was 80 plus miles away from them talking on an HT. So um, you can really uh, get some long distance um, contacts and uh, it's, it's really neat. That's what really hooked me the first time I did it. Went up to Sawney Mountain here locally in my backyard, which is like three miles away and, um, you know, made the you know, 60, 70, and 80 mile contacts. That was, that was really cool. Also, it's kind of neat to see the effects of the temperature inversions that typically happen in the springtime. And you'll get in um, the, um, in the early morning in, in June. So usually that happens, not always, but um, I've had some pretty good luck. I've had contacts several hundred miles out into Florida and, um, and uh, Virginia on two meters during the contest. Also, I love soda, hiking, outdoors, physical act activity, uh, and the challenge of it, you know, it's just um, it keeps me sharp. And um, I always like to see what else I can improve on my setup. Um, and like I said, I work, operate in the single operator FM only category. One thing that um, I guess is a plus and a minus, there's a low number of participants in that SOFM category. So, you know, it'd be great to see more people, but then it also give me more competition. And um, I think, you know, I, I, I guess I really like the FM category because there was, well, first starting out, there wasn't that much, much competition, but I also just loved uh, the ability to reach out to so many people that uh, weren't aware that, you know, an FM radio could, could uh, transmit that far. And then the adventure, I've been on some really, really cool adventures doing this. So that's a sunset on Raven Ball, the June of 2020. I had some, some of the most amazing views I had ever seen were doing that during that June 2020 contest. So, some other factors to success, uh, proximity to at least one metropolitan, metropolitan area. So when I was at um, on Blood Mountain, it was relatively close to Atlanta. So I had a really good uh, line of sight into Atlanta. So I got a lot of people in the Atlanta area. When I went up to Wyabald, I was thinking it may be too far north and it pretty much was. I, it was very difficult to get anyone um, in the North Atlanta area unless they had a really good station. And uh, I was kind of far, too far away from a lot of the other metropolitan, metropolitan areas. So I was constantly swinging the beam around trying to get different people from all over the place. Um, also on my checklist, it has to be a public, publicly accessible area and I has to provide overnight camping. And I like it to be off the beaten path. One problem with Blood Mountain was there was just a lot of traffic from um, from hikers, day hikers and things like that um, on the AT at Blood Mountain. And uh, I was able to get, you know, off the trail and kind of hidden, but I still had a lot of people coming by to say, hey, what are you doing? What is that? So I think in 2016, I printed off a bunch of pamphlets basically explaining what I was going to do or what I was doing and put a, a rock on top of it. And I just said, hey, go take that. <laughs> so they didn't have to talk to me. So that worked pretty well. But um, Moving up to um, Waya Bald and uh, Raven Bald, there's a lot less traffic on that. It's uh, not, it doesn't seem to be um, so many people coming by. So this is uh, kind of taken from another presentation that I had given, and I wanted to talk about this because it concentrated on six meters. This was uh, a lot of fun, kind of opposite of the mountains because it's it was only about five feet off the ground. The Dry Tortugas, I don't know if you guys know where that is, but it's um, out in the Gulf. So 
I went with one of my friends and it's kind of cool because the semi rare grid square EL 84 Dry Tortugas National Park, also called Garden Key. It's um, the site of Fort Jefferson, which was built in 1860 and has a bunch of different designators. So in, in, on top of doing the June, June VHF contest, we're also claiming the um, islands on the air, US islands on the air, uh, WWFF, which I think is something, something flora and fauna and flora. I figured it stands for exactly. And there was also two lighthouses. So some people were chasing those things too. So we had a lot of people that were looking for us. That was pretty good. So Dry Tortugas is halfway between Key West and Cuba. Can't even see it on the map because it's zoomed so far out there, but zoom a little bit in. You can see where it's labeled Dry Tortugas. Still can't see it. It's 68 miles west of Key West. And it's just a little speck of land out in the Gulf. There's a satellite photo of it and a little bit closer. And we were given access to operate from the North Dock, which is the part there sticking up kind of in the middle of the screen, the North part there. So before we went, <clears throat> before I went, several times I had set up and tested individual items and then one month out, set up uh, the full thing in the backyard, tested everything, made a checklist, verified um, everything was gonna work and um, did some power calculations with actually you know, doing um, some test calls for like an hour and doing the power calculations from that. So this is just a partial list of some of the stuff that I brought. I tried to keep it down and I didn't try to bring everything in the, plus the kitchen sink. So there was um, not a whole lot of extra stuff that I brought. And for that contest, because it was uh, so remote and I was doing six meters and it was a rear grid square, I wanted to run FT8 to give as many people a chance to get that rear grid square. And if for those of you that participate in the uh, Fred Fish Memorial Award, a lot of people that uh, are trying to get that are looking for this grid square. So FT8 requires your clock to be exact. So for time sync, I did it through a GPS satellite. And then uh, we did a little bit of F, uh, FT8 on 30 meters, at least I did. And then when the contest started, it just did six meters FT8 for the contest. And as soon as the contest started, it was, the band was open. It was wall to wall signals on six meters. I've never seen anything like it. It was, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And um, ran 50 watts pretty much for the entire contest. Um, the, ele or the antenna was a four element beam at about 30 feet. And we were on that dock and it was sort of shooting out over the salt water. Um, I think that had to help some with the signal because I'd never seen six meters like that before. Uh, the furthest contacts were Bermuda, Portugal, Spain, and a couple Canadian stations. So that was pretty amazing to me. Made over 230 contacts on six meters that weekend. So, it was, I had to say, it was super hot that week, that weekend. Um, I would never do it in June again. Even at night, the temperatures dropped. Well, they never dropped below 85 degrees. And the hermit crabs came out by the thousands at night. It was, uh, it was pretty crazy. Um, some lessons learned. Well, originally we had four or five people going and then a bunch of people dropped out. And it was just the two of us. So it was a lot to manage for just two people. Um, my friend brought just too much equipment and I kept teasing him. I was going to throw his, uh, lead acid battery over the side of the boat because it weighed like a hundred pounds. And, uh, <laughs> it's like half, half the time I wasn't kidding, but, um, you know, we had to, um, we, we're lucky that we brought some stuff to, to shade us from the heat because it was, the heat was just brutal. The sun was so bright. There's a picture of uh, Blood Mountain. The elevation there, 4,460 feet. 
I didn't operate from there. That's the actual rock by the shelter that everyone climbs up and kind of, you know, has lunch and relax and looks and uh, takes in the view. Another picture of the setup of uh, Blood Mountain in 2015. And notice it's just they have the uh, the only antenna I had up there was the uh, two meter 440 log periodic, and uh, then I had two six meter wire dipoles. One was stretched out east west, one was north south, um, with a A B switch so I could switch it, and then I had a 220 roll up J pole for for that band. There's a shelter. So I was kind of tucked off the side, off the AT near the official summit. That's my uh, meager accommodations with uh, <laughs> um, the radio equipment and, and cables all over the place. So remember I had to hike, pack all this stuff up. Um, and that, that year was uh, 2015. I, all that stuff was about 70 pounds, including the water. Um, Blood Mountains, a 2.2 mile hike, and about I have to look again. I don't know if it's 1500 feet elevation gain or 2000, but it, it's a lot, and especially in June. It, you know, it's and it's warm, and it takes a couple hours to hike all that stuff up there. That's looking up to the top of the tent there, and you can see the kind of on the left there the uh, six meter one of the six meter uh, wire antennas. That's my setup there for that year. And you can see, and the, actually, I think I had three, I had three sealed lead acid batteries. Now that I look at that, I forgot about that. I had, <laughs> I had three sealed lead acid batteries and then one lithium polymer. And I decided after that year, I needed to not do that again and just go all with lithium, lithium polymer. MRE meal, little snack, so. Not the best, but you know, you do what you have to do. I made a note for myself the next year to, maybe I should consider um, fasting. That wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't have to carry all that stuff up there. <laughs> and actually um, I was so busy operating and um, it was kind of warm. I ended up not eating all my food and left uh, a whole sealed MRE meal at the shelter for one of those, some hikers, you know, see if figured they could use it. Armstrong rotor. So I can uh, turn it around. I actually ended up putting uh, south, east, north, west on the, the pole. So when I was looking at it, I kind of could figure out without having to strain my neck and look straight up about which direction it was pointing. And um, because I didn't have anything underneath the pole after turning it so much over the weekend, it pretty much put a hole in the ground about four or five inches and had all this dirt stuck in the end. So that was like another note to make for myself for next year to, to improve and, and do something to solve that problem. So that's most of the pack, 70 pounds of it from 2015. Too much equipment. So VHF preparations, it's really essential to do planning for any of these trips. Uh, you can't go back or to a store if you have uh, something that you forgot. So, you know, you only need to take what you, what you need, exactly what you need and uh, nothing more, nothing less. So it's really important to set up everything and, and test everything out and make sure that you have everything to make a list. So, you know, when you go, you can check those things off the list and make sure that you have them. So 2016, again, back at Blood Mountain. This time the pack weight was about 50 pounds. So much easier to hike up, although it was still pretty heavy. Notice a smaller tent, lighter tent. Also had the um, lighter weight lithium polymer battery. So that helped. That was probably the, the two biggest things. So you can kind of see the antennas there. So you see the addition of the six meter mocks on there. So that year, 
I had made a plate, put a line on the pole there, and then uh, and directions, you know, I had a compass up there so I could set the plate oriented to, to north. So when I rotated the thing, you could see which direction I was pointed. So that really helped me. I wouldn't have to kind of guess. And then I had a sheet said, um, you know, what direction certain cities were. So if, if I heard someone and they said they were in, say, Alfreda, then I knew what direction to rotate the, the beam to, to to get the, you know, hopefully the best or, or get it pretty much zeroed in on them. So that was a, that was a big help. And then in 2017, I went to a wild fall in North Carolina, elevation 5,325 feet there. There's my son. We went there, I think a week or two below, a week or two earlier to check it out. And that was um, a little platform that used to have a roof on it, but had burned the year before. They, uh, the previous year, they had a lot, some horrible fires. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, here in the southeast, there was a lot of fires, and half the summit was burned, but somehow it stopped at the ridge line. So it was it was really weird. On one side of the summit had all these burnt trees, and the other side was uh, normal, just regular uh, trees growing with greens, green grass and green leaves. So there, I'm on the other side of this, the ridge line. There on the other side of that tower, had my setup. And uh, it was just a quor short quarter mile hike from my car for this one. So I was able to bring like a little step ladder and a few other nice things. So there, my newer setup, I included a 220 Yagi antenna on the bottom. So a little bit of an upgrade, but unfortunately I only had a five watt HT hooked up to that. So it was still kind of, hindered by the less power. And then I also had uh, the, um, that stone structure kind of blocking me going uh, one direction, but uh, I didn't want to put it up too much higher because the wind picked up. I was afraid I was gonna break the mask or something like that. So kind of put up my antennas according to importance, you know, the two meter 70 centimeter in the very top because I made the most, make the most contacts with that. And then uh, six meters, and then the, the 220. And these things are always kind of tricky to figure out how to guide these things off and keep them out of the way of the public and all that. So it's always a, kind of a challenge. So I kind of was, I was sharing the summit with Dean K2JB and Howard W4PH. They came with their setup doing single sideband. They were gonna do a mix of single sideband and FM, but um, part way into that they were having issues. So they ended up just doing single sideband, which was good for me because originally I was gonna set up about where they were. And when I got up there, they were already up there. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you guys were gonna be up here. So I ended up you know, going up to the official summit about a quarter mile away so to give me some distance. And uh, it worked out pretty well. We didn't really interfere with each other. And they were running a lot more power than I was. I was only running 50 Watts max they had uh, amplifiers. So I think they were running 800 watts and uh, they had a generator. So a little nicer setup and they all had a trailer. So they did their thing and I did my thing. And uh, we had uh, dinner before the contest started. So that was kind of nice. I think it was the night before, but. And there's a screen tent, get bugs out. So a little more comfort that year with the addition of tables for the contest. So I was able to put all my radios actually on tables, not on the ground. Then in 2018, dry tortugas, <laughs> elevation about five feet. <laughs> so quite the opposite of being on a mountain. There's my friend, Nathan, next to me on the left. <clears throat> So of course, being out there, you have to bring everything, you know, just like on a mountaintop, you have to bring your own water, food, power. Um, they even say that if a storm or hurricane comes up, you're on your own, basically, you got to shelter in the fort and then wait till it's over with and then they'll come get you. So 
and it's a um, it's a 45 minute sea seaplane ride or a I think it was a three hour hydroplane boat ride. So we took the boat because it was cheaper. Plus we had all of our equipment, and then you know it wouldn't fit on the plane. But uh, we were there for I think three days and four nights. There's a wider view of our setup. Nathan was doing more HF stuff and uh, some satellite stuff. And uh, over in the far left there, I had a 30 meter vertical setup, um, just a wire antenna. And then uh, that weird thing is the, the egg beater for the satellites, all our solar panels there on the ground. And on the right um, had the six meter Yagi. And then on top of that, you can kind of see the uh, two meter 440 log periodic, which the entire weekend, I never made any contacts on two meters or 70 centimeters. And I really tried, but it, that place is just so remote that even trying to get back to Florida, there was just, there was no way it was, um, I didn't have any luck. I couldn't even hear any repeaters. It was, I was, um, I was surprised that I couldn't get into anything. I thought maybe I might get some uh, ducting or something, but it never happened. So pretty much abandoned that after a short while. And then also the, when we first got there, the, um, the ranger said we can only set up on the grass area and the sand area there. And so that's where I initially set up the six meter antenna but it was very close to the path where people go to get to the beach. And I was very nervous that people were constantly walking past it and I didn't want it to fall on them or their trip on something. And we tried to find the guy for like the whole first day that we were there and we couldn't find him. He like basically just disappeared. We never saw him the entire time. So I ended up moving that whole setup um, onto the concrete part and you'll see it in another photo where it is. So there was a hermit crab out in the daytime. And uh, they, were, they, they were kind of fun to play with and uh, annoy Nathan. He didn't like them, but uh, I like to put them on things and let them crawl around and creep them out. So <laughs> that kind of became my buddy. There's another crab that decided to like my solar panel. This fort is really big. If you guys have ever been out there, it's, uh, it's I think, one of the largest um, Civil War forts in existence. I forget how many millions and millions of bricks there are, but there's a lot. Uh, so that's actually looking back at the North Dock area where we were. Some more wildlife. And this place had really good... Um, coral reef. So I did some snorkeling there. Um, pretty amazing, the coral reef that was out there. Looking kind of the uh, other way on the fort. So there's some of uh, Nathan's equipment. Um, pretty much everything you see there is Nathan's. <laughs> he brought a lot of equipment. I kept mine about 100 pounds, and uh, I think he brought probably 600. The limit supposedly for the boat is 100 pounds. So somehow we got away with it and then we tipped the, uh, the guys in the boat very well. So, um, but uh, the, like my six meter setup, the food and water were probably the bulk of my, uh, my weight. What is all of the equipment you see on the other side of the tent there as you look over Nathan's head? Um, on the right? No, straight through. Am I look at? Oh, those, yeah. those are um, bricks. You took them out on the dock out there. Hey, okay, that's the dock. That's what I couldn't tell. Yeah, the brown things. Yeah, yeah. The dock had. Um, he had been out there a couple of years earlier, and he said that uh, there was tons of boats out there. That I guess people from Cuba trying to escape, they would they would come there and then. Um, I guess they would take them in or I don't know what they would do with them, but the, the boats would end up on that dock. They would secure them. And uh, I guess at some point they cleared them out. So um, there was only a few boats there when we were there. 
and there was a lot of empty space. So that was nice with uh, actual D rings that were cemented into the dock. So they made a really good anchor point for a lot of our, uh, our poles. There's a HF array that Nathan had brought. So you can see the how it's guide off to those D rings that made an excellent uh, point. We had um, put the center on a D ring and then uh, put four guy lines out to the other uh, D rings and that thing didn't move at all. So it was very secure. And that area was um, basically, um, I guess, chained off for the public. Like no one was supposed to be out there. So we knew it was gonna be secure and no one was gonna mess with it. There's our setup, <laughs> lots of wires. Um, I, uh, I, everything ran off of the solar panels and my 40 amp hour bioeno battery. That's all I brought. So the computer ran off that. It was a, a direct uh, 12 volt to 18 volt converter DC for the, the computer. So um, nothing went to AC there and everything else was, uh, you know, DC power 12 volts. Nathan ended up bringing a inverter for his setup and it was kind of overly complicated. And so I was kind of teasing him about that, but uh, you know, live and learn. There's uh, another better view of the six meter with the two meter 440 antenna on the top before I moved it. There's the park services tower. So I guess it's probably 150 feet or so. And they had a bunch of stuff up there. I'm sure they could probably reach mainland with that. Pretty cool picture of the fort inside. There's looking down on the North Dock and you can see our tent there. That was when I was about to move the six meter antenna. So I had it, had it down. Actually, at, at, I had it up and there was, um, the wind would pick up and the whole thing was, was bending so much. I, I thought it was gonna, you know, again, fall over and, and, you know, hit someone. So that's why I moved it. I was just so worried about it the, the, the whole time I had it there. So I ended up just moving it. So, Here's a better picture when um, kind of what we ended up with the on the left, the vertical there. You can't really see the six meter, but that's a six meter uh, pole there. And then the, the next vertical one, we had an 80 meter Wyndham up there and then uh, the uh, hex beam there. And there's a better picture of the six meter where I ended up putting it. There was these weird, um, I don't know what they were. They were like uh, metal structures with tubes sticking up and it was a perfect size to put the pole into. So I ended up putting the pole in that, in the, uh, in that tube and then guy it off, you know, part way up. And that thing was solid the entire weekend. So I was very happy about that. And, uh, you know, it gave it a better, um, uh, better, I guess, angle up over the um, salt water. I know this is a VHF program, but since you mentioned it, how was 80 meter propagation from that area? Um, I think we only used it like once or twice. I, since, you know, there's nothing out there, we didn't have internet or anything. Um, I used WinLink to send and receive email. So we were able to send and receive some uh, email from there. And I, we used, I think we used that antenna mainly for that and just kind of to play around with. So um, again, you know, we probably bought, brought more stuff than we needed, but um, I think Nathan ended up using it for 40 meters. There's a panoramic view of it. So you can see some of the boat trailers there. But it was, uh, it was a pretty cool trip. And uh, we, we kept it pretty affordable, I think. I only spent about $500 for the entire trip, so. 
So then in, in 2020, Raven Bald. Took me a while. I couldn't figure out where these pictures were, and I forgot where I'd put them, and then uh, I found them last night. So <laughs> um, Raven Bald's about 4,700 feet, second highest peak in Georgia. And I don't know if it was because of the pandemic or what, but that the view up there and the pictures that I got were the I, I will never forget some of the the views. It was it was just breathtaking. I mean the pictures don't even do it justice, but I mean you can basically see out to the horizon, just mountains on top of mountains on top of mountains. It was it was just amazing. So I don't know if there was less smog or what, but And it's kind of cool to be up there. We got up there on uh, Friday evening, so we were able to see the the sunset, which is just spectacular. This was the sunset. This is the shadow of the mountain on the horizon at sunset. It's I've never seen anything like that before. It's I was like it was just blown away. And there's the sunset. So Raven Bald, if you've never been up there, has this pretty large platform. Uh, I think it's like um, 12 or 14 feet high. I can't remember, but a uh, pretty good size wooden deck. It used to be a uh, um, stone observation tower. And then they, I guess, took the top off and put a, a deck on it. So it actually makes a pretty good location to, to mount stuff from. So I end up putting my my pole up there with all my antennas. So you can imagine 4,700 feet plus, I don't know, 12 feet plus 21 feet <laughs> with some directional antennas. You're pretty much king of the mountain at that point. You're running 50 watts with the directional antenna at that altitude. So the very top, I had that elk log periodic. Uh, underneath that, the modified PAR electronics, six meters. When I had first research this trying to find you know a solution for six meters I, I stumbled across the uh par electronics um moxon and i liked it because it was very lightweight it was under a pound and when i talked to them i asked them hey can i use this for fm they're like no it won't work for fm i'm like well you know why not why can't i just modify it a little bit and they're like no it won't work well end up ordering one anyhow modifying it and got a 1.2 to 1 um, SWR after modifying it for FM. So I, I actually have two of them One now, one that uh, is on my roof for sideband use, and then one that I use for portable use that's for FM. And uh, it's been a fantastic antenna. And then uh, just underneath that, can't really see it that well, is a duplexer. So I have a um, Yaesu 8900, it's a quad band radio, FM only, but it does 10 meters, six meters, two meters and 440. So I use a duplexer to combine the two meter 440 and the six meters into one coax that runs down into the one input into that radio. So then I can use um, the three bands basically in one radio. And it, I can monitor six meters and two meters or six meters and 440 at the same time since it's kind of like a dual um, watch radio. So that um, helps cut down on the amount of radios I need. So I can only have, I only need one radio to, to do three bands. And then um, for, and then, and then a 220 Yagi underneath that, that goes to a, um, a Linko 220, 25 watt radio. So that was a, a nice step up from the HT that I was using previously and uh, um, it has a much better um, receiver on it. Uh, I'm still looking to improve on the 220 Yagi because it's a really heavy Yagi. It's like commercially made Yagi that probably weighs three pounds. And uh, that's why it's on the bottom too, because it's, it's very heavy. And there's me going good night. <laughs> I left my radios on that night just to monitor. I, I usually call it quits about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And um, at least 
last year. I left them on all night, didn't hear a single thing on two meters or six meters or 220. So um, I probably could have just shut them off, but just monitoring the radios take very little power. So it wasn't that much of a drain. And I think when I looked at the, the, um, the power consumption of the entire weekend, I only used 27 amp hours out of the 40 amp hour battery. And I brought that, I brought the 40 amp hour lithium iron phosphate bioeno battery. I brought a 15 amp hour bioeno. I brought a nine amp hour. And I think I brought the four amp hour. So I only used the big one and that was pretty much it. So I think this year I'm only gonna bring the one big battery and maybe a really small battery for charging the phone. And uh, hopefully that'll be enough for the entire week. And I've never, except for up on why a bald, I've never ran out of battery. So um, cross my fingers that I won't run out of battery and hopefully there won't be bad storms. So we'll see, you know, this year, maybe I can um, break 200 QSOs and uh, hopefully break, uh, you know, 7,000 points. So we'll see. So questions, comments, suggestions? Yeah, that, mast, that mast that you have, it looks aluminum. Um, how heavy does that thing weigh? Yeah, it is aluminum. It's, um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, so how do I do this? It's aluminum and, um, oh, here we go, stop share. It weighs probably three pounds, four pounds. Oh. It's not, not very heavy. And how tall it looks like it goes up, what about 30 feet, 20 feet, or it's it's 21 feet. Okay. Oh, and then um I never got this in the past, but last month, I don't know if you guys can see this. Is that backwards? <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, you gotta... That's a plaque. Yeah, they sent me this. Sweet. Nice. So that was that was really nice. For the first time I've gotten a, a plaque for any contest, although I don't really participate in contests except for the vhf contest so that was kind of nice so i was like oh this is nice um yeah the uh the pole is 21 feet and then um the i made the kind of extension to mount the log periodic on top the, on top the elk log periodic it can't be near metal because it will react to it so all that's made out of pvc so that adds about another two feet to the top do you use that as a hiking stick when you're going up there? Uh, no, it's kind of too long. Yeah, it's funny. I've hiked up uh, mountains with it before, and people think I'm like doing some type of survey for the uh, federal government or something like that. You know, <laughs> so it's kind of funny when when people stop and ask. Let me see what else. I have several other questions, but I'd like to get some other people to. Well, okay. Uh... I wanted to ask Brian if he knows Steve, uh, WG0AT, if you ever seen anything. He uh, hikes out in the Colorado mountains, but he's got two goats that he uses. Uh, oh, yeah. Stuff. You ever seen? Yeah, yeah Peanut and, um, well, I think Peanut oh, passed well, away. Died, I think, <laughs> but, uh, but he was a presenter uh, a few years ago at uh, the... Uh, Four days in May in Dayton for the QRP. It was one of the greatest presentations I've ever seen. But you might consider getting a goat. You can haul a lot more stuff up. <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, I told my wife for years, I'm like, I want a goat for a pet. And uh, I don't think her HOA would be too fond of it. But um, I think they're kind of neat, you know. I usually use my uh, son, or I have used my son lately to haul my stuff up when he's available. I did uh, uh, last year, I uh, recruited him to. To hike up with me and <laughs> carry some stuff. After raising three sons, I think goats would be easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, I have a couple of questions right. um, as well. I don't want to monopolize this, but I've been thinking about the June VHF contest. But uh, I have a, a Yasu 817, which is five watts all mode. Um, but uh, I would probably prefer to work from like a roadside pullout. So with a, like a six, well, six, is six meters pretty much FT8 nowadays or single sideband or CW? Do you know? Well, I'll tell you. So when I was up there last year on, on uh, Raven Bald, some guys came up with me 
and they brought their 817 with a small Yagi, they were making contacts on five watts into Florida. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> on two meters. When the, when the conditions are right, it, yeah, it's all it's all terrific. Um, do, do you think it would still be viable to work from uh, like one of the roadside pullouts, you know, north of Dahlonega? Oh, definitely. Um, um, oh, I can't think. Uh, yeah, there's the a couple that have a good clear shot, you yeah, know, I both can to tell the north and the south. That was going to be some of my comments. If you want to go to Chester T Overlook, yeah, which is on Highway 60, that's usually where I would set up. It's a nice pullout, and there's trees there. We would hang antennas off that. That's been for the past several years where I've done the June as well as the September VHF contest from that location. Uh -huh. Not doing that this year. Woody Gap is another one you can yeah. park there. And that's another. So I'm, I'm also looking at easy spots if you want to go up high. And then yeah. last year, Ryan, when I worked you, I couldn't work you on UHF from my house, even though I got an antenna 90 feet up in a tree. I'm, it's compensating for a ridge. I drove over near Mala, just north of Mala, Georgia. There's the Academy Sports and Outdoors. That's on a pretty high hill. And okay. I drove up there and just from my car, boom, I worked you on UHF on low yeah. power. I mean, so if you want to drive around Gwinnett County, there are some spots in Gwinnett especially the northern part of Gwinnett that have some nice little hills that are accessible. You just drive, you park there, and you can work all sorts of places from there. Get yeah, your if, parking garage somewhere. Yeah, if you're willing to drive a little ways, uh, Blue Ridge Parkway is an excellent place, place to operate from. There's a lot of different places you can just pull off on the side and operate from there. A lot of rovers will just drive um, at least part of the route through the on the Blue Ridge Parkway because it there's places where it's up you know, 5,000 feet elevation, so. And a few years ago as well, I think it was, I know I work you, I think when you were at WIA, uh, Bob Coleman, WG4I, or I'm sorry, N, what is it? AG4I. Uh, AG4I, yeah. Yeah, very close to yours. Um, we were up at Water Rock Knob, which is 6,030 feet, that parking yeah. lot. But the problem is it was so far, quote, inland from the mountains you couldn't, I mean, I could work into the GARS repeater from there. Of course, that's up, you know, several hundred feet. But as far as working, you know, ground level stations down in this area, uh, it was blocked by other mountains around the perimeter. So Yeah, I, and that's a great I high had. location, but I had only a few little openings that I could work through. Yeah, we had, uh, I had some issues with that, you know, getting back into Atlanta um, with higher mountains blocking it. Um but I did have someone go up Sawney Mountain and work me, you know, on why a ball and that worked fine. So, and he and I think he ended up doing a soda activation while he's up there too. Um, but uh, another funny story when I was on Blood Mountain, I think it was the first year, one of my friends was back in coming here and he was doing some testing on one of his radios hooked up to a dummy load and I could hear him. And I thought it was like DX and I didn't know what was going on because he was just messing around. And then later I found out it was him. And I'm like, I thought, I thought you were DX. And he's like, that was transmitting into a dummy load. So it was direct line of sight and I could hear him. <laughs> so I'm always trying to encourage people as far as what you're doing, you're backpacking or you're hiking, you're going up to some high locations, but for some folks who just want to drive a car, Oh yeah. About Highway 60, there's several different spots. Like I said, Chester T Overlook, which is about 2,700 foot elevation. And you've got, like I said, Woody Gap. And there's a few other places you can drive around if you want to go on some of the gravel roads. Yeah. It's Another a spot that I'm going to this year, and, and there's plenty of room. You're more than welcome to join me up there. But Bob and I are going to go up to Mount Oglethorpe, which is at 3,300 foot elevation. And there are some repeater. There is a repeater there, the uh, 38. 850 machine i forget um anyway they've got a there's a two meter repeater up there which does a fantastic job at&t has stuff up there you know cellular and there's also the faa has got some stuff up there so i did hear some stuff on my radio a little bit of intermod but for the most part it was good and it's a, a nice nice location as far as using the what's up app or what's yeah. up website and you can see exactly where you're going to hit and it's really a nice spot. So I'm going to be heading up there in this year and see how that, well, that works. Yeah. Even, I mean, the difference between 
say having your radio at five or 10 feet and 25 feet is a huge difference. People don't realize. Um, I have a pretty decent gain antenna just on my roof on a tripod and it has really good coverage simplex around the area. And it's, you know, only at 40, 45 feet. So, you know, just driving and getting to just a high spot somewhere, um, you know, around coming, there's several places and it makes a huge difference. Oh, and the other cool thing going between Woody Gap and Chester T Gap, it's two different grid squares. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. That parking lot at Woody Gap is diagonally has a dividing line for the two grid squares. Yeah, you can you can actually cross the road and be in a different grid square. Yeah, at, at the Woody Gap pullout. Yep. yep. Is that likely to be crowded? I mean, you know. No. Well, I've been I've, there and I've not seen it crowd. But go ahead, Ryan. I I, I don't know. I mean, because since COVID, I've been up there a couple times and it's been crazy, especially on the weekends. Um, uh, the couple times I've been up there, it was very hard to get a parking spot. Put it that way. So if you get there early enough, though, it's. I mean, Woody yeah. Gap, when I've operated there in, at Chestity, we also drove down to Woody Gap and there were parking spaces available. Yeah, who knows? It may be different by summer. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I tried um, my hand at uh, uh, BHF a few years ago. I got a mobile set up and an aluminum uh, push pull. If it, basically, it was a pool uh, extension for a scoop for a pool cleaning. And I put it up and I had a couple of antennas. I had a lot of fun. Went to Fort Mountain State yeah. Park. Oh, yeah. It had, had decent elevation. But I tell you, when the, when the conditions are open, it's a lot of fun. And and most of my contacts, uh, at least 60 co or more contacts were uh, six meters. And six meters to the north and the west, just uh, mobile. And I uh, uh, had one one two meter contact that must have been the ducting part because it was it was like they were sitting next to me and they were in Pensacola so Ooh, yeah. yeah it's awesome yeah that's and, really and, neat. Um, yeah and one. you don't have and like you said you just drive around and, and I don't particularly submit my scores for contests but I love giving you all the uh, contacts and such yeah there was uh I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016 but uh there was uh, the a Sunday morning, I heard some people on two meters talking and then realized they were in Virginia and um, got some contacts there. And then about as soon as the, about the time the uh, ducting kind of went away, um, I picked up six meter e-skip and I, I didn't quite know what was happening at first. It was the first time it ha had ever happened to me. And I heard some guy with a five call sign call and he said, Boston. And I'm thinking, that can't be right. And I call back and he's up in Boston. And it's like, he's sitting right next to me. I'm like, this is crazy. So, <laughs> and then I worked a couple, you know, a bunch of people up there in the Northeast and on six meter FM for like 45 minutes. So did you find there were a number of people on 52.525? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's not as common as um, two meter. You know, the bulk of my contacts are on two meter and then 70 centimeter and then six meter to some extent. A lot of people don't have really, the, I, I, it's a combination of things. A lot of times people's radios, when they put it over to six meter FM, it wants to do some split or duplex for repeaters or their antenna is not tuned right or something, you know, it's, it seems like it's a little more difficult for people. Um, so that, that's sometimes a challenge and it's only worth one point. So, you know, the, the 220 and 440 contacts I rather get because they're, they're two points each, but I like the multipliers. And somebody asked a question earlier about FT8 versus sideband on six meters. I know from two years ago, the VHF contest, we heard quite a few people, including Mexico, on two meter sideband, but the vast majority was uh, FT8. I mean, just loads yeah. of FT8 contacts. But you know, sideband, we started like, okay, I've worked this guy before. I've worked this guy before. There were a number of people there, but you, you kind of ran out of uh, new people that were showing up. But FT8 was just gangbusters. Yeah, yeah. But for me, that introduces another level of complexity because my laptop's not going to hold out for two days, whereas I have no trouble powering my little rig. Yep. Well, you can yeah. still, uh, there's still enough sideband activity to keep that going. 
That's for sure on six okay. meters. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. At least for the first for a try. I've never oh, operated six meters in my life, and I've been oper licensed for nearly forty years. Oh my gosh, you'll love six meters. <laughs> Magic band. I mean, you get bit by the bug. I love six meters. You, you know, Brian, my my you, your laptop might run out of power, but my pen and paper don't run out of power. But for FT8. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, good point. Sir. Yeah, FT8, that's, yeah. Well, invest in a power inverter and a solar panel. and Yeah, that's why I say another level of complexity. And then you have to have some way to keep time sync. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got that. Yeah, I run a whisper beacon pretty much all the time with incredible results. Wow. Okay. Yeah, like I said, when I was in dry tortugas, uh, I don't know, if, yeah, I think I mentioned it. I uh, did um, the GPS satellite. To, to keep the time sync. Does so. your computer drift that much? Because I mean, I do the time sync and go off, out, and then we had no problem. Um, drift. Probably not, but it was just cheap insurance. Just you know, one less thing to go wrong. You know, we didn't have access to the internet or anything out there, so <laughs> I wanted to make sure that it was going to be you know correct. <laughs> so. So, if anything, for encouragement for other folks who. May not, as I think Joe, you had mentioned, just uh, if you're not going to be in the contest for the sake of collecting points, you can still get on an hour or so. Go ahead and work Ryan. Go ahead and work other people that are on the contest because they need, you know, contacts to be able to get some points in there and you'll yeah. have some fun in the same time. You can, you yeah, definitely. I mean, log, but just get on there and see how far your simplex signal will go. It'll surprise you. Yeah, even if you just have an HT. You know, go outside somewhere to a high spot and see what you can hear and maybe call CQ a few times and you'll you'll probably be surprised who comes back to you, especially during a contest. Like W3 CP yep. he usually has decent operation. And then the W4 NH guys, oh my gosh. They're <laughs> yeah. usually up either their Dahlonega place is incredible, but yep. they also if they go up to Mile High Campground, which is in Cherokee Indian Reservation land, just next to the Great Smoky yep. Mountain National Park. And it's truly up a mile high, and it's got a nice corridor down here to Gwinnett County. And yeah, I've worked with them easily. Yeah, I've uh, operated with them uh, a couple of years, and you know they're running, you know, a kilowatt or more on all the bands. So yeah. they're doing sometimes. I guess you know, they've done moon bounce before from up there too. So oh, nice. They're using mostly vertical polarization and horizontal. Yeah, they're, they're that was going to be my horizontal. question for six meters horizontal polar polarization. So. Yeah, so even even for FM. Yeah. So you saw my mox on. I have it horizontal. Um, I mean, I don't really have a choice, but it didn't really seem to make I don't think it really makes so much difference. And most people that you're gonna contact are trying to utilize their sideband six meter antenna and use it for FM, you know, to make a contact with me anyhow. So um unless they have a, a vertical whip or something for six meters. And then when you get the e-skip going, it doesn't really matter. It's going to be yeah. in some odd polarization anyhow. So. Right. So question. So for those of us that are not uh, contesting, but if we want to join the, the party and give context, the question is the only thing we need to know is our grid square, correct? Correct. And you don't need to log it. So, you know, don't be afraid that, oh, I don't want to contact him because then I'll have to log it. You don't have to log it. Um, the only thing you need to do is, you know, give me your call sign and your grid square. If you don't know what your grid square is, I think you can look it up in QRZ that your, your profile should say what grid square you're in. There's a lot of other apps that will tell you too. Yeah, if your home station, and there's also some apps for your phone, if you're out mobile and yep. do you require a four character grid square or a six character? It's only four character. It's only when you get up, I think, 900 megahertz and above, you have to do the six grid, six uh, position. So, but I mean, it doesn't hurt if you want to give all six, but I only need four. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'll have 1.2 gig with me when I'm up on Mount Oglethorpe. But yeah, so, yeah, you'll probably need about, six. Only about two people that I was able to work <laughs> the last time. Probably, probably W3CP. That was one of them. Yep. And the W4 and H guys are the other one. Yep. <laughs> Figures. Yep. Yeah, I have a 900 megahertz radio, but um, the single operator FM only band is only six meters, two meters. Um, 
220 and 440. So those are the only bands I work. Oh, so it doesn't cover 1.2? No, nope, doesn't cover 900 or 1.2. So oh. and maybe I'll skip it. It's another extra hassle to hook. Well, I mean, in. you can operate that. It's just you don't operate. You'll operate in a different category. I think um, I want to say one year I made. It must have been when I was at home. I think I made a 900 megahertz contact, or uh, maybe it was somewhere else. But um, um, I logged it, but it didn't count for points. Hmm. <clears throat> so uh, for for I know on Android at least there's an app called Ham GPS, which. Yeah. If you're in a park or something like that, I don't know if it's focusing, but it gives you your grid square down to the minute digits. Wow. So you could be out if you're in a park or a summit. And if you weren't planning on, um, you know, uh, activating, but all of a sudden you are, you can find out your grid square pretty easily. Ham GPS, it's on Android at least. Okay. I'm looking it up right now. Another interesting thing, there was a discussion on, I can't remember if it was on Facebook, on one of the like soda websites or something. Um, they, someone was saying that uh, they couldn't figure out why people, or he couldn't hear people, I think it was, or they couldn't hear him or something like that. And that's where, you know, if you're on a, high mountaintop and you're the difference between running five watts and 50 watts sometimes people have their squelch set up a little bit high or they're scanning and it just won't stop on a weaker signal um so you know running 50 watts the directional beam will a lot of times get a lot of those people that are just have their radios and scan or their squelch is set too high and it will trip the radio so i end up getting a lot more contacts that way i've noticed uh, from like when I first started out only running 10 Watts or five Watts. So, um, <clears throat> last year I really made a huge gain on the 220 band. I think I made 20 contacts on 220 versus previous years where I only made like six or eight or nine. So but that's the difference between five Watts HT and a 25 Watt, you know, mobile radio and 220. Oh, I know what I was mention, Ryan. You're talking about a, an antenna. Of course, you can get a Cushcraft or something else like that, you know, 220 antenna if you wanted to. But what I've got is a, it's an actual TV antenna from Stellar Labs is the brand. And I got it through Newark Electronics. And it was like, I don't know, 20 bucks. But it's a, they have like a nine element and they've also got a 13 element and you can break it apart or whatever if you want. Huh. But actually, it says it operates from 174 up to 230 megahertz. And I swept it, and sure enough, it does. Now, granted, it's 75 ohms, but I've used that with my HT. And the ballon in there evidently can handle 5 watts. It hasn't burned up yet, although I'd like to go ahead and replace it with a different ballon, so I truly am matching it. But I've used it on 220, and it works. It's cheap. Hmm. And lightweight. Yeah. Well, I'm, I I wanted to thank Ryan for for giving us this presentation tonight. Hey, Ryan.